Well, good morning, Wesley family. We are glad you're here with us today, however you're joining us by Facebook, by YouTube, and by Zoom. And so first of all, we want to ask you to engage uh, with that with that feed. If you're on uh, Facebook, go ahead and comment and like our video. Uh, if you're on YouTube, be sure to uh, give us some comments. And if you're on YouTube, uh, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That'll help us out quite a bit. Uh, if we get to 100 subscribers, then we get a shorter uh, name for our, uh, our, um, our videos. So uh, that will help us out a lot. Uh, we want to invite you to stay engaged. And so uh, be following us on Facebook. Uh, be checking your emails. Uh, we send out an email every Monday with some announcements. And then we send out an email every Friday uh, with some worship materials. Uh, for the for the following Sunday. So uh, if you want to receive our emails uh, on Mondays and Fridays, uh, you can send Mary Jo an email, and her email address is wesley at wesleyonline.org. Uh, check out our website, which is uh, wesleyonline.org, and while you're there, uh, be sure to support your church. Uh, you can send your gifts uh, by check, or you can give online at Wesley. Uh, online.org slash give. And so we appreciate all of that. Uh, and so we are glad you're joining us today. Uh, let us open with a word of prayer. Father, we praise you. Through your word and Holy Spirit, you created all things. You reveal your salvation in all the world by sending to us Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Through your Holy Spirit, you give us a share in your life and love. Fill us with the vision of your glory, that we may always serve and praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
to any kids that we have joining us from the Baker family. We have a children's sermon today, and we're going to talk a little bit about dirty laundry. <laughs> so what do you suppose dirty laundry has to do with the Bible? How to clean dirty laundry. How to clean dirty laundry? Oh. We're dirty and God's the washer. To, uh, we're dirty and God's the washer? Um, we can. It's like the clothes are... Like, since the clothes get washed, it's like there's sin on the clothes, um. and we're the sin, and then we just, our sin washes away. Okay, I like where you're headed. So, I had Addie bring down her dirty clothes basket, and it's full of clothes that she has worn. Now, ladies, what do you suppose would happen if we just put all of your dirty clothes in there, left them in there, and then you... When you ran out of clothes, you just dumped those clothes out, refolded them, and put them back on. Why, why don't um, we do that? We've been really, really stinky, and there'd be stains on the clothes, and we would not look good or smell good. Okay. And so the washer cleans us so that our clothes are clean and not dirty anymore. Okay. Not stinky. And not stinky. I'm not sure that a lot of people would want to be around you if you just wore the same clothes over and over and mm. over again. Do you think? No. No, for sure not. I think about like when your dad goes um, cycling and he comes home with his super sweaty clothes. What if he never washed those? I would not want to hug him. <laughs> That'd be pretty gross. So... Um, you are exactly right, or you are on the right lines, that today we're going to talk a little bit about becoming new again or repenting. So the verse I want to talk about is in Acts um, chapter 3, verse 19, and it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So we know that we are all sinful people. Can we agree on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all make mistakes, and if we continue to make those mistakes, things kind of get harder and harder, right? Yeah. So when we make mistakes, then what does God ask us to do? We, we, he, asks, he asks us to pray so he can forgive our sins. Yeah, exactly. He asks us to pray and to just ask for forgiveness, and that's as simple as it is, right? Mm -hmm. We pray to God, we ask for forgiveness, and that that gets all that yuck out of our lives, and it washes us clean. Just like when our clothes get dirty, we throw them into the washer with some laundry detergent and some water, and wash them up, throw them in the dryer, and they come that's out. kind of like the Holy Spirit. You put the Holy Spirit and like the like special thing that cleans away the sin, and you just when you take yourself out, you're, done, you're clean. Then you're like clean or laundry, right? When we invite the Holy Spirit in and we ask for forgiveness, then we're just like a, a new shirt coming out of the wash, right? Yeah. Or a new person. Or a new person. We become new in Christ, right? Yes. So that's what our, um, what our verse is about today and what Pastor Brian is going to talk a little bit about. So just know that we all make mistakes and our God loves us so much that he wants to take those mistakes and wipe them clean, but we need to ask for that forgiveness so that he can provide it for us. Let's pray. Will you do that with me? Dear God, Dear God, thank you, thank you for forgiving me, for forgiving me, and making me new again, and making me new again. Okay. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 11 through 26. Listen to the word of God. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at it, us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One, 
and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know is made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who he has appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today is Trinity Sunday, that is the first Sunday after Pentecost, and this week we are in Acts chapter 3. And this week, this is Peter's uh, second sermon in the book of Acts, and there is a pattern uh, beginning to emerge. First, there is a miracle that draws a crowd, followed by a sermon, that then is followed by a response, that then is followed by persecution. The miracle that preceded this particular sermon was the healing of the lame beggar at the temple. You can read about that, I hope you have, in your study guides, which, by the way, please keep up in your study guides. Um, You've read about that, that miracle of healing that had taken place. And the persecution will follow in the next chapter, in chapter 4. Peter's second sermon in Acts chapter 3 sounds a lot like the one in Acts chapter 2. He proclaims that Jesus, whom the people had rejected and the authorities executed, was risen from the dead and is the long-awaited Messiah. He uses the Old Testament prophets and talks about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these promises that go clear back to Genesis, clear back, in fact, to the Garden of Eden, to Abraham and the patriarchs, to Moses and all of the prophets. And he then calls on the people to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. And the crux of this sermon is in verse 19. In verse 19, Peter says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And so let's take that apart a little bit, that verse 19. First, Peter says, repent. And this is serious business, because we live in a world that is in need of repentance We need to repent of our fear, which leads to anger, which leads to hate, which leads to suffering, to quote Yoda. Hate of the other, 
the other race, the other political position, hate of those who are wearing masks, and hate of those who are choosing not to. We hate the little piggy that went to market, and we hate the little piggy that stays home. We hate because we fear. And then, of course, there's pride. Pride that manifests itself in virtue signaling on both sides. The pride that says, nobody can tell me what to do. And the pride that says, look at me, I'm following the rules and doing my part. Aren't I a good boy or a good girl? Romans 14, 1 through 4 tells us, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them to stand. And Paul's going to go on in that chapter to talk about there's some people who celebrate certain days, who have certain observances, and there's others that don't. And we could extend that beyond the religious world into the secular world. There's some people who feel the need to go out and, 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 and kind of re-engage, and there's others who don't feel safe doing that yet. And that's okay. Don't let that become a point of hatred and fear and pride. You see the cycle of fear, hatred, and violence continues to repeat itself and continues to escalate as people respond to hatred and violence with more hatred and violence and evil seizes the opportunity of evil as an excuse for more evil and the devil laughs. And I'm convinced that fear pride, and hate will do more damage to us individually in our spirits and collectively in our communities than coronavirus ever will to our public health and our economy. And it's time. It's time to admit that all of us, your pastor included, are carrying inside of us Some combination of fear, hate, and pride. It's different for all of us. It's directed differently for all of us. But we all carry that in us because of original sin. But you see, if we don't admit it, we can't repent of it. And we can never be forgiven, and we can never be healed, and our world can never be healed. And so we need to repent. We need to repent of our fear and our hatred and our pride in all of its forms, no matter who it's directed toward. We need to repent. We need to turn to God, Paul says. Or Peter says, I'm sorry. We need to turn to God. Uh, we we want to turn all kinds of ways. We want to turn to the advice of experts. We want to turn to our government. We want some kind of worldly solutions to our spiritual problems, but they're just not there. The, we will never find worldly solutions to what at, are, what at heart are spiritual problems. I'm going to say something rather rough if I didn't already say something rough before. 
This is going to sound strange to you, but hear me out. The church needs to stop putting people first because people don't belong in first place. We need to put God first. We need to stop making our priority trying to meet people's needs and fulfill their wants and respond to their preferences. Instead, we need to make glorifying God in worship and proclaiming His Word our first priority. We need to seek spiritual solutions to spiritual problems. If we do that, If we put God first, if we put God's glory first, if we put God's word first, then people's needs, their real ultimate needs, will be met. A lot of people go into ministry because they want to help people. Well, can I let you in on my dirty little secret? I don't want to help people. I love people, but and if I wanted to help them, I'd, I'd do a better job of that as, as a doctor or something like that. But what I want primarily is to glorify God, to preach the gospel and to serve the sacraments. And as it turns out, that's the best thing I can do to help people. We need to be a church that has a heart for God first and a heart for people that flows out of that. We need to turn to God. We need to turn to spiritual solutions for spiritual problems and not to the world. When we repent and when we turn to God, Peter says that our sins will be wiped out, that we'll be forgiven, and that we will receive refreshing If Acts 3.19 is the crux of the Acts 3 sermon, then I want you to compare it to the crux of the Acts 2 sermon, which is in Acts 2.37-39, where Peter says there, when the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You see the similarities there? Repentance, forgiveness, refreshing. You see, there are many beautiful, complex, and diverse layers of depth in Christian practice that have developed over the centuries. But the gospel itself remains stunningly simple. Repent of your sins. Believe in Jesus Christ. Receive forgiveness Receive refreshing. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive blessing. Receive eternal life. Repent of your sins. Believe in Jesus. Receive his gifts. Repent. Believe. Receive. Refreshing is what we all want. Maybe you had some refreshing during this quarantine, or at least maybe at first. Once you kind of got settled in, you kind of enjoyed it. And maybe you are beginning to feel refreshed now that things are starting to open back up. Maybe you won't feel refreshed until we get an all clear. Maybe you just want to keep clicking refresh and hoping it will all start over. And even when COVID-19 has passed into the history books, our world is still horribly broken and in need of refreshing. Refreshing in our time, while wonderful 
and welcomed will only be partial and temporary until Jesus returns. Then it will be perfect and eternal. We have this promise from God that if we repent, if we turn to him, if we are faithful, if we are patient, God will send times of refreshing. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the promise of refreshing. And God, we so badly need refreshing. We need refreshing in the midst of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and quarantine. God, we need refreshing in the racial tensions and the resulting violence that continues to grow in our communities. God, we need refreshing in our personal lives in ways that are known only to you. God, you promise us that refreshing, and you tell us how to get it by repenting of our sins, by turning to you in faith. God, help us to do that. Help us to do that individually. Help us to do that as families. Help us to do that as a church. Help us to do that as a community. Help us to do that as a society. God, grant us faith. Grant us repentance. Send us refreshing. God, we pray for our church. We pray that you'd bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for all those who are in need in our church, in our community, and throughout the world today, all those who are sick, all those who are suffering. We pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world today. God, we pray for the persecuted church. God, we pray for churches and communities that are struggling. God, uh, we pray for churches that have experienced vandalism in the past weeks. God, we pray for the United Methodist Church. We pray for this annual conference in our Bishop Lori, this district, and our Superintendent Doug. God, we pray for our community and the men and women who serve us both at home and abroad. God, those in health care, those first responders, law enforcement, God, all those that are working for us. God, we pray that you would bless them and protect them. God, we pray for our world leaders at every level. We pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world, the blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And now, God, we pray that you would hear the prayers of each and every heart that is gathered before you today. God, that you'd hear us pray in our hearts. God, that you'd hear us as we pray with our families wherever we are gathered. Loving God, we know that you have heard our prayers. God, from wherever they are lifted up and for those uh, that remain silent upon our hearts, God, you know our every need and when we do not know how to pray, your spirit intercedes for us 
with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you'd hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand if that's something that you can do where you are and join me in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
rage, grace which like the Lord the giver never fails from age to age. From each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear for a glory. Receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ, experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen. Thank you.